Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video. Now, small confession, I thought today's little CD that we're going to be taking a look at was a soft key product, like the CDs that we're going through on shovelware diggers. It actually isn't, so I kind of remembered that wrong. But in any case, it's this CD right here. It's the Imagitech Multimedia Corporation's Hottest Game CD, and they call it a 40 pack. Now, first of all, Let's not get this confused with the Imagitech that operates out of the UK and sells software for learning how to drive. This Imagitech was a shareware vendor that started up in 1994 over in British Columbia here in Canada. Now, I was curious because I never, I completely forgot that this company was a thing. So I decided to like look them up, see if they still existed or anything. They lasted two years. <laughs> two years before they shut down. Now, interestingly enough, they actually didn't officially shut down until 2004, but that's because they literally just disbanded. They didn't do anything to properly shut down the corporation. They just stopped filing tax reports in 1996. So yeah, it's safe to say that's when they went out of business. So clearly their shareware model wasn't working and I'm not surprised. Like, I mean, let's take a look at, before we actually talk about why I'm talking about these things, let's take a look at the catalog program that's on this CD. Because this catalog program, I mean, you look through here and there's a ton of software to choose from. And not just games, like, I mean, there's business programs, there's graphics software, educational programs, there's all kinds of things on this CD, but they're not actually on this CD. What we see in here is like a list of things you can order discs for. And they're charging $4.25 or something like that per disc. Reminder, this is shareware they're selling, not full version software. Now granted, it's basically direct consumer shareware, but $4.25 per disc? That's insane! Especially when you're talking 1994, when the internet's already starting to come into play and people are already like, handing discs to each other to trade games or going on bulletin board systems like this was a terrible idea for a business model but that's not the worst of it first of all i should quickly explain that when i was a kid and i found this at the stores and decided to pick it up i think it was a radio shack they actually had a whole bunch of cds like this all made by the same company and most of them were six game packs so naturally when i saw the 40 i was drawn to that number as opposed to the six game packs and it's interesting because they actually you know did good sorting and selected decent software like well for the most part like i mean billy the kid is on here and scunny carts on here but for the most part they selected pretty decent titles but there were a whole bunch of these cds like i mean there were dozens of these and it's like how could a shareware vendor who's just starting up and has a flawed business model to start with, how in the world are they making money mastering so many different CDs? Like, I mean, mastering a CD so that you can produce more and more of them is not a cheap process. And here they are just out the door, dozens of CDs. Like, what's going on? So let's actually take a look inside this thing because this is pretty pertinent to what we're talking about here. When you first open this thing up, there's passwords on the inside. Why do you need passwords to access the shareware games on the CD? Like, I mean, yeah, you've got um, this special program you can access that lets you access all the software and makes it easier to install and everything. But the interesting thing is that if you don't use that program, you can't access the software on here. It's all stored away in locked ARJ files, and the passwords I just showed you don't work on the ARJ files. And then if you actually take a look at the CD itself, it's pretty generic, wouldn't you say? It has this Imagination Station logo and a volume and series number, which lines up with the pass... Wait a minute. Yeah, if you haven't figured it out yet, they did indeed include a lot of their software on this CD, because what they were doing was they were just mastering a few CDs and then giving them splashy different covers with different passwords on the inside so that they could essentially sell dozens of different packages all using the exact 
same CD. Now you have to admit that was kind of a clever tactic. It saved them a whole bunch of money and allowed them to market to different kinds of people. Instead of having just one generic package, they could market to business people, they could market to people looking for software to help them in the home, software for doing graphics, software for helping to teach their kids something or for learning different languages. All of that software is stuff that was easier for them to market with different, you know, covers and everything. But they did it by using the exact same CD for so many of them. Now, obviously, they mastered more than one CD because this is clearly the third one they did. But yeah, it was <laughs> they had something going there in terms of making money through that stuff. It's just a shame that their business model was just so flawed in terms of getting people to order shareware directly from them. But here is the icing on the cake, okay? As a kid, I never figured out how to get access to the rest of the software on this CD. As an adult, I decided to do some hex editing because I knew how to do that later in life. And it turns out that the passwords are just stored as plain text. You go through all this effort to lock away your software in different <laughs> CDs across dozens of different ones, and all the passwords are stored in the executable as plain text. <laughs> How do you make that mistake? And it gets even more interesting than that. Like, I mean, I took the block of text that has all the passwords and everything, and I copied it straight from the executable into Notepad. And you're probably looking at this and thinking, oh, well, of course it didn't copy properly. You just copy hex values into Notepad and everything. But no, this is how it actually appears in the executable as well. There's like no delimiters or anything between all of the data in here. So actually sorting out the passwords from the things like the titles of the different programs and special code numbers to indicate each individual program that took a little bit of doing, but with some effort, I did actually delimit this thing properly. So as you can see on screen now, here is the entire list of passwords stored as plain text in the executable. And what's even more bizarre than any of this, despite the fact that there's like no breaks or delimiters or anything in this data, is that this data isn't even used by the executable. Now you might be thinking, how in the world could I know that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. You see, there's a spelling error in one particular part of this list here. It actually says Quadra Command here, and even the eight character limited identifier is Quadra. But this is actually Quatra Command with a T, not a D. And if you go into the program and type in this password, it actually says Quatra Command which means this plain text data that says Quadra isn't even being accessed. So it's almost like that this text data is like leftover from just some kind of compile or something. Like as if someone was copying this data into the executable and then didn't do like some sort of blanking with the compilation or included like comments or something because this data here is useless. And like, I mean, if you look through all of this stuff here, you'll see that there comes a point where it stops being properly sorted out. And it just starts to become random, and some of the passwords actually start getting missed, and then it ultimately ends before it's even gone through a fraction of all the software they supposedly had available. So yeah, I just wanted to give you guys a quick overview of what this particular shareware vendor was doing. It's no wonder they only lasted two years, given... <laughs> that. I'm willing to bet people did notice that and figured it out on their own, but I kind of I kind of feel a little proud of myself for being able to figure that out on my own through my own effort later in life, but in any case, I'm going to post the list of passwords on my website, like as a text file that you can da download. It doesn't really matter. It's all shareware. Like, it, every single program on this CD was free software because it was either shareware versions or freeware to begin with, so... I don't feel bad about posting that password list. So if you guys have this particular, let me open it up again, the particular CD, the Volume 101 Series 3 CD, go ahead, try the passwords out, and <laughs> you'll be surprised. They all work. 
Now, mind you, the vast majority of them only access a single title because for some reason, every program on here needed to have its own password. But as you look through the list, if you see a password that doesn't have any particular program associated with it, that will access everything in the block that I've highlighted out. Because I've, I've sort of made it easier to look at by deep, by adding like spacing between the different blocks of programs in the list and everything. So that's it for that. You, you can download the entire raw text section if you want to. I've made that available as well. And that's about it, really. So hope you guys enjoyed that. And stay tuned for the next episode of Ancient DOS Games, episode 211. <laughs> We're in the 200s now. <laughs> so I'm going to be taking a look at... Actually, I'm not going to give you guys a hint. Let's see if any of you can just guess wildly at what it's going to be. So, in any case, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next episode of Ancient DOS Games. Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small sample of you guys.